Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Venom oozed into our hearts with an entertaining, mostly understandable Tom Hardy, who kicks family-friendly ass, even in a cinematic universe without Spider-Man. How did they do it? Well, this movie is filled with interesting design choices and subtle references to the Venom comics and deeper parallels to a number of cinematic influences. So I'm gonna break it all down as we rewatch this movie scene by scene. And spoiler warning, in case you haven't seen Venom yet, what you doing here? Let's get started. Okay, Venom opens in space with a crash landing of a Life Foundation space shuttle. Now Venom's classic origin in the comics is he's an alien symbiote that latches onto Spider-Man when he's off Earth so that when he returns he gets this new cool black suit that makes Peter Parker a little too aggressive and impulsive so he detaches the symbiote and accidentally passes it on to his rival at the Daily Bugle, Eddie Brock. That's how Venom traditionally still possesses some of the Spider-Man DNA, that's why he kind of resembles him and possesses an inky version of Peter's web powers and has that white spider logo on his chest. But as I said before, this Venom movie movie origin story bypasses a Spider-Man stat. See, Sony produced this movie and technically owns the film rights to Spider-Man as well, but currently their Tom Holland Spider-Man is being co-produced with Marvel in the MCU, whereas this Venom movie is separate from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So this Venom has no white spider logo on the chest and his powers are less Spider-Man-y than they are, I guess, hulky? But we do get one Marvel Easter egg right away in this scene. The surviving astronaut piloting the shuttle is named Jameson, which is a nod to John Jameson, the astronaut son of J. Jonah Jameson. There are actually versions of the Venom comics where his space shuttle is the one that brings the symbiote to Earth. By the way, some have seen some similarity between this movie's opening and the 2017 movie Life, which features an alien specimen outbreak on a space shuttle that's orbiting Earth. But no, Venom is not a sequel to Life. Some people are saying the trailers shared some stock footage, but guys, this is just a case of Hollywood sticking to some familiar concepts. Let's not confuse incompetence with conspiracy. Anyway, this space expedition was funded by Carlton Drake, Riz Ahmed, of the Life Foundation. Drake and the Life Foundation are from the Marvel comics as well. It's a shadowy cabal of survivalists who plan for Earth's future after nuclear holocaust. Though here, Ahmed's Drake is more of a Elon Musk type technology environmentalist titan of industry. This Venom movie was largely based on the Venom Lethal Protector comics, which relocate Eddie Brock from a villain in New York to an anti-hero in San Francisco, fighting against the Life Foundation's five spinoff symbiotes, Riot, Phage, Scream, Agony, and Lasher. Now, only Riot gets named in this movie, though apparently this EMT was credited as Donna. In the comics, the symbiote Scream attaches to the woman Donna Diego. Moving on to Eddie Brock, Tom Hardy. Now, Hardy is definitely a disciplined physical actor who never backs down from a big character choice. Big for you. In this case, he based Eddie Brock on Woody Allen, what he described as the filmmaker's tortured neurosis and humor, though I assume not the creepily sleeping with your adopted stepdaughter part. He also looked to UFC fighter Conor McGregor for McGregor's taste and capability for uber violence, and the rapper Redman, whom he described as out of control and living rent free in his head. His fiance is Anne Wayne, Michelle Williams. Anne is a lawyer and Eddie's wife turned ex-wife in the comics as well, more on her later. Eddie gets assigned to interview Drake, and we see that he's a cool reporter, hosting video news segments that look a lot like Vice News. Guys, most reporters are not that cool. And over dinner, he and Anne allude to an incident that led to him moving out to San Francisco. This could be a nod to Eddie's backstory in the comics. See, there's a villain named Sin Eater, and Eddie interviewed with someone he thought was the Sin Eater. He confessed to all the crimes. But then Spider-Man caught the real Sin Eater and basically exposed Eddie's scoop as false. It forced him to resign his newspaper in disgrace. We also learn and see that Anne works for a law firm called Michelini and McFarlane, which is actually a reference to David Michelini and Todd McFarlane, comic artists who created the Venom character in the late 80s. Eddie uses Anne's confidential legal records to blow up his interview with Drake, getting himself fired and dumped. Now, his new apartment is in the Schuler Building, which is an Easter egg nod to Randy Schuler. That's the name of the child fan who wrote a letter to Marvel Comics in the 80s requesting for Spider-Man to have a new black suit, and Marvel actually bought the idea off him with a check for two. $220 and then proceeded to make big time f you money with the property. While looking for new work, Eddie calls a man named Barney Bushkin. That's another Marvel reference. He's the editor of the Daily Globe, a rival newspaper to J. Jonah Jameson's Daily Bugle. Meanwhile, Drake and his Life Foundation enablers conduct human testing with the symbiotes. By his side is Dora Skirth, Jenny Slate, and this poor volunteer's name is Isaac, which Drake realizes is also the name of an Old Testament figure whose father, Abraham, nearly sacrificed him to show his faith to God. But if you listen to Carlton Drake throughout this movie, he clearly has a 
some more blasphemous beliefs. Basically, he views himself as an Old Testament God, willing to go through with acts of wrath. Later, he actually describes humans as such poor design. This movie was directed by Ruben Fleischer, who has directed some great horror comedies like Zombieland and Santa Clarita Diet. He cited directors like John Carpenter and David Cronenberg as influences for this movie, and in the scene, you can definitely see their voices in this horror imagery. Carpenter directed The Thing, which has a similar frightening alien specimen taking over humans and mutilating their bodies. And Cronenberg is really the master of practical body horror in movies like The Fly, in which Jeff Goldblum plays a scientist who, kind of like Drake, aims to fuse two species but ends up turning himself into a freak of nature. Now, these symbiotes were created with CGI, and the VFX supervisor said that they based their look on the organic movement of sea creatures and scientific demonstrations of unusual non-Newtonian fluids. The inhumanity of this experiment leads Dora to whistleblow to Eddie, and she mentions she once believed Drake was curing cancer. This is actually another nod to the comics. In the Ultimate Comics, Venom also kind of began as an attempt to cure cancer. This eventually leads to Eddie and Dora sneaking into the lab at night, where Dora gives Eddie the lowdown, explaining that the Light Foundation found the symbiotes, which of course was corrected from the symbiote pronunciation in the trailer, on a comet. And we later learn that there's a whole race of these things, which is adapted from the other major comic influence on this movie, Planet of the Symbiotes. The symbiotes are actually a race called the Clintar, of which Venom was kind of a loser for wanting to bond with its host instead of consume it. Eddie's snooping leads to him getting contaminated by Maria, his homeless friend turned test subject. He escapes in the woods and returns home where this movie finally becomes Venom. Tom Hardy as an actor gets to show off his Jekyll and Hyde aspect of the character, and we hear Venom's voice for the first time. Eddie which actually was also recorded by Hardy. He apparently cited singer James Brown as an influence on the voice, so I don't really hear that there. Eddie goofs off around town, and he gets to know his new co-pilot. He learns that Venom prefers living flesh, but he'll settle for tater tots and chocolate. The comics actually explain that Venom eats human heads because he needs phenylthylamine, which is a chemical that stimulates the human brain. The Clintar species requires this chemical, but it's also found in chocolate. Eddie returns to his place where he runs into Drake's head of security. Now this guy's name is Roland Tree, which is another name from the comics. Trace is another member of the Life Foundation. Fleischer actually did a director breakdown of this fight for Vanity Fair. They should check out. But as we watch it, you can really see how Tom Hardy makes Eddie Brock look so puppeteered. He reacts to his limbs in real time as they operate out of his control. Actually, his movement is a reference to Steve Martin in the movie All of Me, when Lily Tomlin is in his head fighting with him for control of his body. Actually, if you look real, real closely at Hardy's ear, you can almost see a hidden earpiece that he wore so that he could listen to his own Venom eye audio that he recorded before and then react to them as he's listening to the voice inside his head in real time. Also during this scene, you can finally hear the Venom music score with these deep synthesized bass notes to emphasize the symbiote's emergence. This movie was composed by Ludwig Göransson, who is the same guy who composed Black Panther. There's actually another Black Panther Easter egg in this scene. One of the guards here was the same stunt actor who did all of Chadwick Boseman's stunts in Black Panther. This leads to the exciting motorcycle chase through the streets of San Francisco, ending with Venom healing Eddie's broken limbs and fully overtaking his body. Now the VFX here is pretty impressive. Notice how Venom's mouth appears to swallow Eddie's head the way a snake would swallow its prey, both literally and holistically consuming Eddie Brock. Concept artist Paolo Giandoso cited natural predators like sharks and snakes and the way that their drool looks as they swallow as reference points for this design. Meanwhile, the VFX supervisor discussed the difficulty in animating Venom's tongue because, you know, it really needs to be twisted in crazy shapes to look like the character of Venom. But also remember the tongue is necessary in the way that the mouth looks as words are formed. So the animators got around this by studying actors like Clint Eastwood and Jack Palance, known for delivering their dialogue through clenched teeth. That way the tongue could be more flexible with the animation. So notice Venom's dialogue here. That line is actually a direct quote from Venom in the comics, The Amazing Spider-Man issue 374. Eddie insists on getting his incriminating photos to his former editor, so he and Venom climb San Francisco's Transamerica Pyramid, kind of like King Kong, but in this case, the plane really does rattle the beast, presumably from the sound waves of the jet engines. Eddie later tells Anne that the symbiote's weaknesses are sound waves and fire, which is adapted from the comics. It was actually sonic energy from church bells that detached the symbiote from Peter Parker. Though, not to pry, but Venom's earlier reaction to the MRI was a little weird considering MRIs don't use sound waves. They technically use radio waves and electromagnetism. Just putting it out there. Anyway, we come to this SWAT shootout, during which, if you listen closely, you can hear one of the officers let out a Wilhelm scream. 
and brings Eddie back to her new boyfriend Dan's medical lab, where she uses a high sound frequency to force the symbiote off him, and it later reattaches to that dog that we saw earlier. Which could be a nod to the instances when Venom binds to a dog in the comics, but I think there's a deeper reference here. Earlier, you may have heard this dog's name, Gemini, which you may know is a constellation and a sign of the zodiac. Gemini actually refers to the half twins, Castor and Pollux, from Greek mythology. When Castor died, Pollux shared his immortality with his twin to keep the two of them together. And yeah, I think there's definitely a parallel between their shared existence and the relationship between Eddie and Venom. Two losers who just need each other to survive. Drake tries to kill Eddie, but he gets rescued by Anne, now herself binded to Venom. Now, this is a nod to She Venom. That's when Venom binds to Anne in the comics and it causes her to lash out so violently that Anne later actually takes her own life out of guilt. Whereas Michelle Williams, like everyone else in this movie, was just like, oh, I bit someone's head off. Okay, moving on. That brings us to Eddie and Venom's final fight with Drake and Riot. Now, as I said before, Riot is one of the five Life Foundation offspring from the comics, though here Venom describes him as a team leader, suggesting that on their home planet, Riot holds a higher rank in their race, which would explain why he can shapeshift into more specific weapons. The concept designer said that he imagined Riot was the shattered mirror image of the protagonist, with sharper angles and longer claws, similar to obsidian knives. During this fight, you may have noticed Riot ripping Venom's face off. That's actually an homage to the cover of the comic Venom Carnage Unleashed, number three. Eddie defeats Drake and Riot, saves the day! He checks in with Anne, and he promises a more disciplined career in journalism, starting off with a career with a figure whom we later learn in the post credit scene is Cletus Cassidy, the serial killer who becomes Carnage. We get one last Marvel wink, a cameo from Mr. Stanley, walking his dog. Could be referring to Eddie and Anne, or Eddie and Venom. Now, look, I know it's a little weird to see Stanley, considering this isn't the MCU, but remember, Venom is still a Marvel Comics property, and before the MCU even existed, Stan would show up all the time in the X-Men movies, and then the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies, a bunch of other stuff. He is a mass hallucination that belongs to everyone. My question for you is, which direction would you rather see this Venom franchise going? A broader and more fan service direction so that Venom and Spider-Man could share the screen? Or a darker and more violent direction so that Venom and Carnage could lead in a movie together? Comment down below with your thoughts. And thanks to our sponsor, Skillshare, for helping us make this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, business, technology, and more. Its premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes on must-know topics so you can improve your skills Skills, unlock new opportunities, do the work you love. As you've probably noticed, I like going really deep into the craft of these films that we talk about, and learning more about film editing has really helped my own career as a screenwriter and a filmmaker. So personally, I got a lot out of Jordi Vandeput's video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro 2018 for beginners. He's just really great with all the tips and the insight. I highly recommend him. Also, folks, Skillshare is a lot more affordable than most learning platforms out there. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. And we're gonna even do a special offer for you guys. The first five 500 people to sign up with the link in the description below will get their first two months for free. Just go to skl.sh slash newrockstar7 or click on the link in the description. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EABoss. Subscribe to New Rockstars for these in-depth breakdowns for all the stuff you love and lots of random punch-ins. So thanks for watching out. Ah, too close.